Hey, wasn't that great worship? Are y'all excited today? Am I the only one excited? <laughs> All right. Well, so good to see you guys today. Super pumped to be in the house and excited to just get in God's word. And my name is Levi, uh, pastor here at High Ridge, and super honored just to come alongside so many of those on the dream team and those who come and serve so faithfully and so thankful for you. And, and I just want to give it up real quick to all of our first time guests. Family, let's welcome them today. So glad you are here. And uh, if you would, there's a connect card that's on your seat. And if you could fill that card out today, and if you can drop that off at our information center right outside these doors, we have a gift for you. We don't want to hassle you. We don't want to bug you. We just want to say thank you so much for joining us today. And I also want to welcome all of you who are watching online. Thank you so much for faithfully connecting in to what God is doing here at High Ridge. I don't know about you, but God is doing something special here at High Ridge. Do you guys believe that? There's something special that God is doing, and I'm just so excited to be part of it. Before we get into the message today, a few announcements. We have what we call Growth Track. Uh, Growth Track is a two-part class, and part one teaches us all about who we are as a church. And so maybe you've been coming for a while, and you've been wondering about the church. You've been kind of checking us out and, and just want to know more about our, our beliefs and kind of um, how things are stewarded here at High Ridge or how things are organized. And um, you can come to that uh, first class. And then the second class is how you can get involved. Maybe see how you can get on the dream team, how you can serve. We take a spiritual gifts test where you can learn how you're gifted so that you can get in the game and we can see lives change. Can I get an amen? That is why we are here. So our first class is going to be in June. So we have all of May for you to just kind of think through it, uh, put it on your calendar. Uh, we can, I always say invite people, but man, let's go. Let's get in the game. It's going to be amazing. Also, we have what we call journey steps. Here at High Ridge, we exist to invite you on a journey where you can know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. And so if you notice to your left over here, there are banners there. And so each banner, we have a team specifically for you to ask questions and get involved in. Maybe today you're going to give your life to Jesus and you can go back to that salvation banner or maybe you have given your life and we have a Bible for you and some next steps for you. If you want to get water baptized, if you want to get in a group, if you want to sign up for Grow Track or serve or somehow lead, maybe lead a group and get connected, well, that's the place to go. We have a team that's there and ready for you. And also, I just want to say personally, thank you for your generosity. Thank you so much. For you guys, we're a little over a year old, and God is moving. We are not surviving. We are thriving. Come on. We are thriving. And if I could just tell you all the salvations and the life change and the baptisms last Sunday and what God is doing, and he's healing marriages, and things are working, and it's happening, and it's because you are faithfully giving to the Lord. And I just want to say, as your pastor, thank you, thank you. I cannot tell you how much, how thankful I am for that, for being obedient to Christ. Amen? All right, let's go ahead and pray today as we dive into his word. Father, we thank you, Lord, today. We thank you, Father, for your word. I pray, Lord, you speak to us today. As we hear your word and you speak to our hearts as we grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we are in a series titled Heroes. And for the last few weeks, we learned about different heroes in the Bible. Now, we know that the ultimate hero is Jesus. There's no other hero more important than Jesus, right? And so uh, and we learned about him um, on Easter. So we learned more about Jesus then. And so the following week, we learned about Elijah and about Elijah. And last week, it was about Noah. Well, today we're going to talk about, drum roll, brrr, David. All right, David. Okay, so David, just powerful, powerful man of God, a shepherd boy. And we're going to kind of dive into this so much on David. And so we're going to kind of talk a little bit about his life and take some practical tips and pointers on how we can grow with our Christ with David. Now, we want to start first off that we find David in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. And, and before we get into David, we want to talk a little bit about Samuel. Okay, so Samuel was a prophet in the Old Testament. And his name actually means it's seer, which means prophet, which means that he was a prophetic voice to the nations. It's who Samuel was. At this time, um, the children of Israel, they go to him and they want a king, okay? 
And we see this in 1 Samuel. Um, there's 8, 9. All just, if I encourage you to read 1 and 2 Samuel. Just read through it. It's powerful. Um, we don't have time to go through everything today, but I, w- I encourage you to read that. It's so powerful, the story of David. So anyways, um, they wanted a king, so they go to Samuel. And because at this point, their king was God. And Samuel's like, what are you talking about? Why do you need another king? Because God is your king. But they wanted a king that can rule the nation. So then Samuel goes to God and talks to God about it. And then, then Samuel goes back to the children of Israel and says, hey, look, you know, I, I know you want a king, but this is what it's going to cost you. And he begins to tell them that they're going to have to start paying taxes and, and that they have the true king, which is God. Um, but they still insisted, they still wanted to have their king. So let's go ahead and go into 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse 19. And Samuel tries to warn them, and we're going to see this. It says, but the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations with the king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And so we know that, that really the plan was for God to be their king. Verse 21, when Samuel heard all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord. The Lord answered, listen to them and give them a king. Now, in chapter 9, their king, Samuel, he anoints Saul. Now, he's, he's now the king of Israel. Fast forward to chapter 15, King Saul disobeyed the Lord, and the Lord rejects Saul as king. So, now he's a king. He made some mistakes, and he now rejects him as king. Chapter 16 tells us that Samuel anoints now David, okay, David as the king of Israel, So he was anointed as king, but was not officially the king yet, okay? But though he was anointed as king, and there was a time period where he served King Saul still in the palace. And um, even the Bible even says that the spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And David played an instrument, and he was faithfully serving King Saul. Though he was anointed as king and not yet king, he anointed him that way. And then we all know the story about David and Goliath. We're going to talk about it, but I want to take some some pointers out of that for our life. Is that a giant named Goliath kept taunting them. Okay, so I want you to picture the, uh, the, the children of Israel, people of Israel, one side, which, is, which are the people of God, and then the other side, the enemies of God, which are the Philistines. Okay, and then this Philistine, this giant would come up to them and taunt them and try to fight them and conquer them. First Samuel chapter 17, verse 23. We're going to read through this today. It says, as he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine, champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance. And David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. So they're running from him. Now, the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel, which is a big deal in those days. Verse 26, David asked the men standing near him, what will be done for the man who kills the Philistine? And I want you to see the language he uses. He calls him a Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel. Who is this? Here it is. Uncircumcised Philistine. Straight up. That he should defy the armies of the living God. So David is like, man, who is this giant, this big giant you are talking about, who is defying the armies of the living God? Not defying Israel, but defying the armies of the living God. He had a conviction about, and he knew how big God was. He didn't see the giant as a giant like they saw him. He says, what are you talking about? You're defying the armies of the living God. They repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. And so I would say this. I believe if David was here today, and I believe there are so many things that David could say. One of the things that I believe that David would say if he was here, he would say, face your giants. Face your giants. And here's the reality is that we all have that one thing, those things that are taunting us in our life. And there's a giant that we have in our life that's taunting us. Maybe it's your past. Maybe it's the mistakes that you've made in your life. Maybe it's facing that bully at school. 
Maybe it's facing that boss or maybe it's, it's, it's you're deciding that I'm not going to be unethical when it comes to my taxes or I'm not going to or, or, or I'm not going to do anything that's not right again. I'm not going to sleep around again. I'm going to stay holy before the Lord. And there's these giants that we have in our life and that are constantly taunting us. And I love David, a young teenager, a young shepherd boy. He steps out and he calls those things as though they are. He says, listen, it's just a Philistine. You're an uncircumcised Philistine. You are somebody. You're not a giant. You're defying the armies of the living God. Maybe it's bad decisions today. And I do want to say this. I believe that David needed Goliath. And I believe that the giants in our life are not something that we are upset about, we're mad about, we're blaming God, we're we're running from those in fear. But if it wasn't for Goliath, would David have really been king? Had an opportunity to show that he was worthy to be the king. Even as a young boy, he was worthy. And that he can fight something that the king and the whole army is running from. And he says, I'll step up. I will fight him. I want to share with you today three keys to defeating giants in your life. And as we're going through this, I want you to think about the giants in your life. That one thing that you need to face. Number one is that we must have the right perspective. We must have the right perspective with our situations and with the giant in our life. The word perspective is the capacity to view things in their true relations or relative importance. And the Israelites said that he was defying Israel. But David said the armies of God. His perspective was different. See, David saw with clarity. When he saw the giant, it was clear to him who the giant was. He says he's an uncircumcised Philistine. That means that he was outside the covenant and the protection of God. So how could you fight me? And how could you win a battle against me when you're not protected by God? And so I don't worry about people who come against me on social media, who says bad things about me, who's wishing that I don't get the promotion, that wish I don't make it. I don't need to worry about what you say because I know who I am in Christ. And, and, And what you say does not define who I am, but what God says defines who I am. And I get excited about David because he's saying, I don't care how big you are. I don't care how, how much armor you're wearing. I don't care about your record and that, and that you were a giant that has slayed many people and won many battles. But he says, you're outside of God's covenant. You're outside of his protection. I'm a man of God. I read my word. I know who I am in Christ. And I'm not worried about what you have to say. But he moves forward. See, he says that he's a disgrace from Israel. But Saul and the Israelites saw the problem instead of seeing God. They didn't see clearly. They saw the problem. They saw this nine and a half foot giant, a veteran of many battles. And the, the tallest man alive would be Sultan Kozan, tallest man living. Obviously, he wasn't the tallest man ever recorded, but he's a part-time farmer from Turkey. And he's eight feet, 2.8 inches. And look how big this guy is. Now, if Goliath was bigger than him, with armor, muscular, like coming at you crazy. I mean, I don't know, I probably wouldn't fight the guy, honestly. I would probably kick him in the knee and run. That's just me. That always works for a guy bigger than you. Um, but I just wanted you to see the perspective. But growth came from an overproduction of growth hormone. And that's how it happened with him, how he got so tall. I want to share with you 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Paul talking to the church in Corinth, and he says, So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. So we don't look at the problems and the situations and what's going on now. We pray about those things, yes, but we don't give in to those things. But I'm going to fix my eyes intentionally on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So I'm going to fix my eyes on things that are eternal, God and people. And this is why launching a church and having a church is that we, we focus on God and we focus on people. We don't need to have the best programs in the world. We're not in competition with any other church. You know why? Because we know our mission. We exist to invite people on a journey where you can know God, find freedom, discover your purpose, and make a difference. It's all about God. It's all about people. And this is why we're here. 
It's all about God, all about people. My, my perspective is eternal. See, the giant in front of you is never bigger than the God inside of you. And many of us need to hear that today. I'm going to say it again. The giant in front of you is never bigger than the God inside of you. You got to know who you have, who you're, who's inside of you, who's speaking to you, who's teaching you, who's training you. It's God. Our God is alive. Our God is not dead. He speaks to us and gives us truth, and we walk in that truth, and he changes our life, and he works through us to help change the lives of others. I'm not sure what giant you have in your life today, but he's not worth a dime. That's what my dad used to say. He ain't worth a dime. Anybody else know that? Okay. So what giant do you see now, and are your eyes on Jesus? We have to have the right perspective. So many times I've dealt with this. One of the times I've, uh, in my, I think I was in my late 20s, maybe early 30s. Um, I just don't really like flying. I'm okay with it now. I can do the whole flying thing. But before, flying was hard for me because, you know, it's the whole takeoff, right? You get in a plane and you get ready to go and then you have the captain. All right, everybody. Uh, why do they all sound like that, by the way? You can never understand what they're saying. All right, so uh, what we're going to do is, uh, everybody, so glad you're here. Thank you for on American Airlines. Uh, make sure your seatbelt's um, buckled and uh, make sure you have an airplane mode. And it's going to be a nice, safe, easy ride all the way to Sacramento. And I'm like, well, great. I like it. Plane takes off. Boom. Not so bad. I'm just kind of, uh, you know, all the way. And then when we get to the top and he just kind of coast. All right. Pull out my little laptop, get some work done. Have me a little Dr. Pepper. Let's go, somebody. <laughs> Give me a couple pretzels. Don't be stingy. I want two bags. <laughs> and you sit down, and you're just loving your ride. And all of a sudden, as I'm on this plane, it's boom, 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 boom. Okay, maybe we hit a bird. I don't know. I'll pray for the bird. And then we just fly. All of a sudden, boom, 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 Like, it was the weirdest thing. It's almost like you're in the air, and you're just like, the plane just quit, it felt like. And you just, and this is, I'm looking around. People are kind of looking around at each other, and I don't know. And oh, sorry about the bumpy ride, guys. Um, uh, it's okay. I just want you to know that the um, air, the um, AC went out, and so we're kind of having some difficulties here. We're gonna land at the close as the nearest airport. <laughs> I'm like the AC went out. So remember, I was going on a conference. I have my wife next to me, filled with faith. I have my leaders behind me who I love, trusted. They have lots of faith. I believe in them. They're right behind me. And so all of a sudden, the ride gets bumpier and just boom. And then, and then one guy stands up. True story. I can't make this stuff up. Turn on a little, little vent, and it, psh, it's cold. We're going down. It screams. And I'm like, oh, Jesus. I'm only in my 20s or whatever. I don't know what age I was. Oh, God. And I turn back to my fearless leaders. I turn around, and I look at them, and they go, we're going down. Start praying. <laughs> what? Why are you in my life? You are no longer my mentor. <laughs> and I'm telling you, we're going. Like, this, crazy. And I'm looking at my wife, and, I'm, and then the guy stands up two rows in front of us on the right side, gets up, throat. I can't make this up, guys. Go ask my wife. She'll tell you the truth. All right. Throws up on the guy in front of him. So I'm just like, it's the, you know, I felt bad for the guy getting thrown up, but I'm thinking about the smell at this moment. And I mean, we're just, everybody's frantic, the little, the little you know, luggage is popping out. And then I look at my wife and I said, listen, I love you. Oh, who's going to take our kids? And we're just talking and she looked at me and I'll never forget, she grabbed my hand. She says, boy, you better listen right here. We are not going to die. We're going to pray, and the Holy Spirit's going to come up in this plane and fly this plane for us. I said, all right, Holy Spirit, I, know, I didn't know you could fly stuff, but come on, Holy Spirit, we need you right now. Because here's the deal. There's nothing I could do but pray. I can't go over there and try to fly the plane. I couldn't fix the plane. I had no trust for the pilot at this moment because the AC was full-blown cold, okay? And I knew it. And I, I mean, my wife, we just started praying and praying, and all of a sudden, he just kind of, just, and then we came down, we landed, and it found out one of the engines went out. Boy, I'd be lying. Can you believe that? I was so mad. Trying not to take an offense from him just lying to me. Um, but this is what I realized. That was my giant. 
all I can really do is pray. All I can really do. See, the, my leaders behind me, their perspective was we're going down. My wife's perspective was pray, we're going to heaven anyways. Actually, she said that. <laughs> hey, if something happened, we're going to heaven anyways. But we were praying. And see, all I could do was pray, not worry, not have fear, not blame God. And maybe you're, you're, you're in your situation now and there's this giant in front of you and we're worrying and we're, we're asking. Listen, you can do more with prayer than anything else. So I started praying for my wife, for me, and I started praying for everybody. I started praying for the pilot. I couldn't stand the pilot. I'm praying for the pilot. Lord, help him. Help them. Lord, do this. And this is what the Lord really talked to me about as I got off the plane and we're walking, is this. If God answered all my prayers, all of my prayers, would it change the world or just change me? And so even when you're dealing with your giant and you're praying. Remember, it's not about us. Even when you're facing your giant, it's still about others. It's still about people. Let us never go through this world where it's all about me and not about the one who really needs Jesus. We got to keep on. Let's keep reading. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 32. Let's keep reading the story. David now meets Goliath. Don't worry about the Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Here goes Saul. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. You'll always have a hater in your life, by the way. You're trying to conquer your giant, there's always a hater that shows up. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. I want you to know, all the young people in the house, God will use you to take down giants. God will use you to make a difference in this community. God has called you, and we're all about the next generation here because those are our next leaders. And don't ever let someone tell you that you're only a boy, you're only a girl. You are a man of God. You are a woman of God. You are anointed by God. You can take that whole high school campus, that whole elementary, that middle school, that college campus. God will use you to take that, and people will look back and say, you know what? It is about the God inside of you and not about you. There's something big inside of you. Verse 34. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. Goes on this story. When a lion or bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. He tough. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. Listen, David is not Tarzan. David is a gangster. All right, he is cold-blooded like, yes. He packing everything. My boy is just, he's, he's something else. Verse 36, I have done this to both lions and bears. Have you been with, next to a lion or a bear? I see them on TV taking out deers and stuff or whatever they be chasing. I'm the, I don't even like going to the zoo to see a lion if that cage come loose. And he says, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine. Look at the language. He's talking to who he is now. This pagan Philistine, too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bear will rescue me from this Philistine. I love this. He's speaking to his giant with faith. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and may the Lord be with you. In other words, bro, you better hope God with you because I am not with you. I'm going to keep looking at him and I'm going to keep running away. I'm going to keep looking at him and I'm going to keep running away. It's time to stop running. It's time to stop running from the giant. It's time to start moving towards it and conquer the giant God has uh, that's in your life. Number two, we must speak with faith. How is our language? How, how do we talk? When we talk about our giant, do we talk about it the way the way David does? And do we talk, how do we talk about ourselves? Are we so confident in who we have in Christ and who we are in Christ that we talk about ourselves? Or or, are we already defeated already by our language? Oh man, I don't know if I'm going to make it today. This is going to be hard. I don't know if we can pay the bills. I don't know. I don't know if I'll get the promotion. I don't know. I don't, I just don't know. It's like, why are we talking like that? If you really serve God and you really believe God is amazing and he's faithful, why don't we tell people that? Why are we speaking so much death on our life and we're defeating ourselves instead of holding on to the truth of God 
in our life. See, my words will determine my direction. Where you're going, where you are today has a lot to do with your words. See, Saul is saying you can't, but David is saying he will. He will. He will. My words always reveal my heart. And I like to do a heart check all the time because we could get so discouraged and so fed up with things that we need to check our hearts. It reveals my heart. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21 says the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So how to grow in speaking faith-filled words? I believe that you must speak what God has done and will do. Just make that a goal. Put that on your refrigerator. Speak what God has done and what he will do. I have faith. No more am I going to sit around and, and speak words as if my God can't do it. My God can heal me. My can, God can restore me. My God can deliver me. My God can make things happen in my life. Yes, he can get me through this. And you know what? Sometimes you may not get through it when you want to get through it. We're going to have trials and tribulations in our life. We're going to have sorrows. That has nothing to do with how good God is. And we got to be just like David and take the horns of that Goliath and speak words of faith and words of healing and words of restoration. There's someone in our life that's struggling and they're running from God or that they need God in their life. What if your words had a lot to do with them truly coming to Jesus? What if our words had a lot to do with them running from Jesus? Faith-filled words. Faith-filled words. Let's keep reading. Let's finish the story. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 38 says, Then Saul gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these. He protested to Saul, I'm not used to them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. And I want to just tell you this, is that we don't have to fight the way other people fight. And I want to encourage you to be who you are. What has God called you to do? How has he called you to attack the the giant or the Goliath in your life? Is that we don't have to have people tell us, oh, wait, it worked for me this way. I'm going to listen to the Lord on how I need to fight. Sometimes fighting someone who hurts you is fighting them with love. I don't need to prove to you that you're wrong. I want to prove to you that my God is real and that my God is powerful. I don't care about winning the battle with you. I want you to know Jesus and to know Christ. Let's go to verse 4. Goliath walked out toward David with his shield barrier ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Then he says this, Am I a dog? He roared at David, That you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. See how he cursed David by the names of his God. He's cursing him by his gods that are not the real God. And he says, come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals. Goliath yelled at him. Yelled at him. Do you have people in your life that has to, has to yell at you and try to intimidate you and try to control you? But I want you to know is that you don't have to put up with that. You can just simply share who Jesus is. Share the love of Christ. He tries to intimidate them. I love David's reply. Verse 45, David replied to the Philistine, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies. So he says, I I like all that. You can hurt me. You can cut me. You can probably cut my head off too and all that. But I come to you with something greater than that. Because even if you kill me, you have not killed me. Because I will go to heaven. And he understood that and knew that. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Then he makes this. Verse 46. Today the Lord will conquer you and I will kill you and cut off your head to the giant. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and the wild animals. So Goliath just said, I'm going to give your body to the dead birds and animals. But 
David said, I'm not only going to kill you, but I'm going I'm to get rid of all your other, everybody else in your army and feed them to the wild birds and animals and all that. And the whole world, this is what it is, and the whole world would know that there is a God in Israel. See, when you face the giant in your life, it will give glory to God. Don't sit on it anymore. Don't hesitate. Don't try to figure it out. Don't, don't try to wonder about things. We have to say, you know what? This is the Goliath in my life. This is a, the giant. I'm going to face him head on. Verse 47. And everyone assembled here would know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. So here he goes. He faces him. Verse 48. As Goliath moved closer to attack, I want you to understand this. Goliath moved, just moved closer to attack, but David quickly ran. There was no hesitation. How many times have you seen your giant move towards you and we start to run back like Saul and the armies did with fear? But he says, I, he quickly ran with confidence knowing that God's on my side. I don't care. If, if, if you kill me, I still win. Right? It doesn't matter because I go to heaven. But I have so much confidence in my God that I'm going to face it head on. David quickly ran out to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone. He hurried, hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank in. So it was hard. He was skilled. And Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. For he had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from his sheath. He used his own weapon. David uses to kill him and cut off his head and let it dangle like this. With his own weapon, he conquered him. Number three, if you want to face the giants in your life, you must move with confidence. Confidence. See, the enemy is attacking our confidence. He's attacking our confidence in Christ. In ourselves, he's, he, he's, he's attacking our confidence. Listen, we cannot allow the enemy to attack our confidence. We got to get our confidence back. We got to get our confidence back. We got to ask the Lord, look, I know it looks so big. I know it's so hard. But listen, I'm going to get my confidence back. Because what I'm doing is for you, not for me. And I know at the end of the day, you are fighting my battles. Some of us, our battles and our giant is in our head. We're thinking about it too much. We're trying to figure it out. We're trying to make up our own plan. Well, how do I do it? I don't know how to do it. God, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? What do I do? How do I do it? How do I do it? Do I go here? Do I go there? Do I take this job? Do I not take that job? Do I start this one? Do I not do that? Oh, no, God. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. And then you're not, you're tired all the time because the battle is in your head. But I want you to know that you have to win the battle in your mind. You have to win the battle in your thought life. And how you do that is you marinate on God's word. That word means ruminate. And you have to constantly not just read it, but you keep reading it. And you keep reading it. And you, and you memorize it. It's like a cow chewing on his cud or whatever. You guys ever seen that before? This is kind of gross. I don't know if I want to say this. Anyways, what happens? A cow just said, a, a cow, they chew their food over and over and over and over. And then it goes down, then it comes back up, and then they chew it, chew it, chew it, chew it, goes back down, comes back up. And here's the reality. I know it's gross. But what if we did the Word of God that way? That we didn't read it because I have a plan and I just need to read the Scripture of the day, but I'm going to sit on it. Like even preparing this message today, I was reading through the Scripture Without anything, I just kept reading on it, reading it over and over, reading it over and over, getting it inside of me, getting it inside of me. All right, God, there's so many ways to go. What, what do I need to hear and what do the people need to hear? Because when I'm preaching, I need to hear it too. Um, yes, I'm a shepherd, but I'm also a sheep. And I need the word of God inside of me as well. And as you read it and marinate on it and read it, and it's like it gets more and more interesting. You're like, oh, why did he do that? Oh, David said that, but then Saul said this. And all, and all of it comes out of constantly reading it and going over it and studying it and getting inside of you. And all those dead things inside of you begin to come alive because the word of God is so powerful and it's so strong. And it cuts the, the, the evilness out of your heart. And listen, I'm telling you, many of us, 
are not winning the battle in our head because, yes, you read the word out of obligation, but you're not marinating on the word. And you're not saying, God, give me a now word out of the scriptures. Like, some of us, we need to come alive in the word again. Not come alive in your calling and come alive on your job and come in live in your finances. And Yeah, that's all great. But what really matters is that we are alive in the word of God so that he's speaking to us every single day. That's what David had. How can he have the confidence to do that? Verse 48 says that as Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran out to meet him. And I want to encourage you today, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Move quickly. David was confident. See, his confidence was in the Lord, not in his ability. Goliath's confidence was in his own ability. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. 2 Chronicles chapter 32 verse 8 says, With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence from what Hezekiah, the king of Judah, said. Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 7 says this, But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. And I just feel impressed today that many of us, were not winning the battle, and we're running in fear like Saul and the army, army of Israel did, is because we got to get our confidence back. See, if there's a Goliath in front of you, that means there's a David inside of you. And we're calling that David inside of us today. We're calling that out, that confidence. We're calling that trust in the Lord out today. We're calling that, like, hey, I know who my God is. I know what that, that giant is. But I'm moving towards it again. Maybe it's a relationship today that's been eating at you and eating at you. And you want it to come together but it's a giant in your life. I believe that God's going to give you the confidence to speak his word on that and his truth. See, David understood that he was not the hero, but that God is the true hero. That when it's all said and done, yes, he conquered it. So everybody else could look like, wow, this guy is so amazing. He, he conquered the giant. But David knew, hold on, I didn't do that. It wasn't me. It was the Jesus inside of me. It was a confidence he put in me to stand up while everybody else was running. So you have to decide to face your giant. And I'll say this, the decisions you make today will determine the stories you tell tomorrow. And there are a lot of us that are going to be sitting around with our grandkids or sitting around with our friends. And I believe that we're going to make a choice to face our giants so we can sit around and say, let me tell you how God showed up. Let me show you how I haven't talked to my sister for 20 years. And it was a giant to me because I knew she was wrong and I knew I was right, but I'm, I'm going to have the confidence to step up and mend that, see that relationship mended again. There's something that God has put inside of your heart and fear is your giant. I want to do it. I want to step out in faith. I want to move towards that. But uh, it's not going to work. So many other people have tried it and work. Well, that's who they are. It's not going to work because you're saying it's not going to work. But if you say, God's called me to do this. I know who my God is. My God is the one that's providing. And when I step out and do this, then God's going to get the glory. And we told ourselves, my family, before we moved here to, to start a church, we said this. The church is going to be built by God in every service, every meeting, every team huddle, everything we do. He's going to get the glory, not us. And I'm telling you today that some of you guys are just one decision away. Some of us are just one step away from your life changing forever. Amen. It's time to face a giant. Somebody tell me, say it's time to face the giant. Those of you watching online today, I'm telling you there's a giant. And God wants you to step out and face the giant. Let's pray today. Can we do that? Every head bowed, every eye closed. I believe this is going to be an important prayer today because many of us have been hanging on this and you're trying to move forward, but you, it's so hard for you. God's going to give you that confidence back. He's going to give you the boldness to step out and say, 
who God is, not who the giant is. If you want prayer today, you say, Pastor, there is a giant in my life, or maybe some of you got multiple giants, <laughs> and you just want some prayer today, I want you to be bold and raise your hand today. Anyone like that today in this place? He has hands all over this place. Anyone know someone that has a giant in their life and they need some prayer? I want you to raise your hand. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for every person to raise their hand today, every person who raised their hand for someone else also who has a giant. I pray right now as we're praying, God, that we're calling out what you can do. We have faith in who you are, God. We're not going to back down to the enemy. We're not going to back down to discouragement. We're not going to back down to fear anymore. We're going to face it head on just like David. He ran quickly to Goliath. We're going to make that decision. I pray right now you give peace. You bring healing. You bring restoration. You bring deliverance. You bring all of that today. And you get our, give us our confidence back in you. In Jesus' name. You can keep your heads bowed, eyes closed. One more prayer before we leave today. You're here today. You say, Pastor, you know, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. And if you were to die today...